There's over 15 million pounds up for grabs in the PDC every year, but does being a professional darts player give you a life of luxury? Joining me to lift the lid in this special series for Sporting Life is Paul Nicholson and Sporting Life writer Chris Hammer. Firstly, Paul, what's it like being a millionaire darts player? I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I think it's a bit of a, a misconception, actually. There are some people within the sport who have made a, a great life for themselves, but we're talking about the people who have done well very recently because the World Championship winning check is now half a million pounds. That's still quite surprising for uh, most people on the street. They don't think that that is the prize unless you actually watch it avidly. But I think if you look at the, the grand scheme of dark players from say the mid seventies to the present day, very few of them have had the life of luxury because they've had problems in their lives, whether it's uh, family issues, breakups, these tend to have impacts on your personal wealth and of course, how you manage that wealth as your career progresses. So millionaire for me, no, but I've been quite shrewd. Firstly then, 15 million pounds is a staggering amount of money. How does that spread out throughout the PDC tournament? There's a lot of money put into the World Championship at the end of the year and uh, it's, it's spread out very evenly over 30 players championship events where the winner gets £12,000. That for winning seven games in a day is extremely fair when you put it like that. European tour events of which there are usually 13 per season, the winner gets £30,000 and the runner-up gets £12,000. So being a runner-up in one of those events is like winning one of the other ones. So when you play a lot of these tournaments and qualify for a lot of these tournaments throughout the course of the year, you might win up to five, six, seven hundred thousand pounds in a season. That's what the elite guys do in the top two or three. But I think Chris and I have spoken on many occasions about what kind of ranking do you need to have to have a very luxurious or comfortable lifestyle. If you're inside the top 32 in the world, you'll be very comfortable. If you're between 32 and 64, you may be okay. You've got to be wary of some of the other things that you're going to need to pay though. What you see online from the orders of merit, it's not particularly accurate as to what kind of lifestyle these people have. When we look at the order of merit, even down to world number 50, it will say they've earned hundred thousand pounds. And then that looks a very luxury lifestyle. But why is that ne not necessarily the case? Well, if you look at someone in their ranking and they have say a hundred thousand pounds, which is you know very achievable for someone who is a very very good player on tour you don't take into consideration what they're paying in a union levy to start with so that's a small percentage of that taken which goes to the players union because they do a lot of things for the players when it comes to welfare health uh, mental well-being that kind of thing and they give them the opportunity to get better insurance policies and look after them that way that's important so that's a chunk of your money gone already then you have to pay uh, your tax bill. Now, depending on what kind of tax situation you're in, you may be someone who doesn't live in the UK. There is a, a, a rule within uh, the taxation uh, system in this country that if you are an overseas player, 20% of that money is already taken away and gone to the tax man. So then you have to figure that out. So we're already past the 80,000 pound mark. What if you've got a manager? They pay for all your expenses, being travel, hotel, transfers. They may command another percentage, so it keeps shrinking. Now, I've talked to Sport and Life in the past about my big win, where I won sixty thousand pounds in one tournament. It's the biggest check I ever got. I walked away with twenty-two thousand. So what? So who who were you giving all that away to? I got, had to give some money to my manager. I'm not. A, liberty to divulge the percentage but uh, it was early in my career so maybe it was a little bit larger than it would have been say if it was later in my career so the manager gets a cut then you've got expenses in there you've got to pay the tax bill I had it all worked out and I knew exactly what I was taking home within about four days of receiving that money so you weren't deflated when you saw what's it so you're only getting a third of it yeah yeah I wasn't deflated I knew exactly what was going on I think it helps that I used to work in finance. Right. So I didn't want to be that person who was you know, spending all of this money uh, on cars and watches, things like that. And then later on the tax man says, oh, by the way, I want, I want 15, 20,000 off you. Because they come for that later, don't they? You, oh yeah. You get the, the prize money in your account, don't you? Yep, you get it within two weeks. Yeah. And after that, you have to put that money aside 
and it's not your money. Mm. It's that simple. That's what I do. Every time I get uh, an invoice paid or some prize money, first thing I do is calculate how much I'm putting aside and it's always too much. Always better to have too much than too little. So when some players win a massive check, have they been guilty in the past or accidentally um, spending spending too much of it yeah. and getting into trouble? Yeah, I don't think it's fair for me to, to name names because I do know a few examples. But ultimately, when people get that big check, they could maybe get a little bit carried away saying there's something I've always wanted. And there's nothing wrong with that. That'd be me. <laughs> I'd have a Ferrari instantly if I got a massive check. <laughs> I think the only thing I bought myself, apart from a watch, which I think was about 700 pounds, yeah. and I got it engraved with the date of the tournament win, I never wear it. It's just a keepsake to remind me of that time. I bought myself a car because I couldn't afford one at the time. So, and it wasn't expensive. I think it was 3,000 pounds. So I was aware that I didn't want to be in the situation of the tax man knocking on the door saying, I want my money and I didn't have it. But there have been people who have gone out and spent uh, portions of what they've won before they've even paid their tax bill. And they may be banking on the fact that they would keep winning to pay that bill later. That's a dangerous way of playing the financial game. Yeah. So when Michael Smith hit that dart to win 500 grand, you don't think, he'll hit modern players now, he wouldn't have thought, I've won half a million pounds. Because you don't. It's a, that's, you've won 500,000 ranking points. The check is 500,000 pounds. But ultimately, when it goes into your account, it is less than that. And then you've got people sending you the invoice saying, this is what you owe me now. You pay it. You've got to be a good business person as well as being a good practicer and good advocate of the dart. Are, are there people within professional dart then to, to help you out with all of this, in, including things like travel and equipment costs and, and tax and things? There are people there to advise you. Very much so. I think this is where the Professional Dart Players Association really come into their own. They've got designated accountants that you can use if you are finding it hard to find a reputable accountant. I've done it that way and I've had the same accountant ever since. Uh, when it comes to insurance policies, which you have to have, things like travel insurance, you may have to get some sort of indemnity insurance. These kind of things can be found via the Professional Dart Players Association. But ultimately, you can do it yourself. You've got to be smart. You can't get impetuous. You can't say, I want that 80 grand car. I want that 15 grand watch. Yeah, you can get them if you want, but you must pay your dues at the end. You've got to be a good citizen as well. And the other thing why people can't get carried away is it's not a fixed wage. If you win 100 grand one year, you, you, players will know next year could be a completely different story. Andrew Gilding winning the UK Open was an amazing story in his first six-figure check in his career. Is there any guarantee that Andrew will do that again? No. People were saying he was going to, because he'd been living in a flat all his life, and they thought, oh, I know you can go and buy a big house. And everyone was, the media and fans were getting carried away for him. Mm. And he was probably thinking, well, I need to look after this underground. I'm not going to, might not get this again. Exactly. I think he's someone who looks at that check as very precious. It's not a guarantee that it will happen again. I think he will work even harder now that he's done that. But in the past, if, you've, if you win that check really early in your career, there is a risk that you think it's always going to be there. In individual sports, there are no guarantees. In team sports, even if you get injured, you may get a paycheck, albeit a reduced one. But in individual sport, if you get injured in darts, if you haven't got one crazy good insurance policy insuring your wrist and your arm and things like that, then let's face it, you might be sitting at home earning nothing for months. Are there, are there, are there other ways of earning money, of course, there must be sponsorship, local exhibitions. Is there any security coming from that sort of thing? I think based on your standing in the game, exhibitions can be an excellent source of income and a great way to network with the fans. One of the greatest things about the sport is the connection between the fans and the player being, it's a very tight knit thing. I think there's a big uh, gap between say footballers and fans there's, there's a big uh, barrier between them from the pitch to the to the stands but with darts it feels like that's a lot closer so at exhibitions you can earn money by putting on a great show and selling merchandise all of these different ways can help uh, your income at the end of the year sponsorships definitely help and having uh, a sponsorship uh, partnership with somebody local or somebody that you truly believe in their product and you can help them as well as they help you, it can be a great thing. Some people have had the same sponsors for many, many years. I know that uh, 
Michael Van Gerwen and Gerwin Price and uh, Peter Wright, they've had some of the same sponsors for many, many years because they believe in the products they're selling, the products they are backing and vice versa. And it works for some people. How, how much do players get to appear at an exhibition? And does it differ, differ from player to player? It does differ from player to player. And it depends on the exposure of said exhibition. You could be something like a, a 50 person exhibition where you've just got one board, and you've got all these people and they all have a photo with you and you might charge a small fee for the night. But then again, an exhibition might be 7,000 people in a stadium. I've done an exhibition with Van Gerwen, Whitlock and Andy Hamilton at the Marvel Stadium in Melbourne. And we had thousands of people there. You may be able to charge a little bit more for something like that, but you, most players have got a set fee for what they do but depending on your standing in the game is how much you can charge. If you're a world champion, your fee goes up automatically. Can you divulge in a few fees that you've heard of without naming names? Um, I think there's probably only two or three players that I've seen who've, who've made five figures for a night's work. Really? And they're all world champions. And what would this, you know, a, a world-ranked 64 player be, expect to get if he went down to a town hall and played in front of Maybe a few hundred. A few hundred. Yeah. yeah. And, I, th I think one, I don't mind talking about Terry Jenkins because he used to love doing exhibitions so much and he'd sell a lot of merchandise, mugs, t-shirts, hats, anything with uh, Terry Jenkins' bully bully on it. He was a genius at it. And I think one year he may have done 77 exhibitions on top of playing on the tour. Now there's a workhorse. There's someone who is going out there to make money, to connect with the fans and no wonder he was so popular. How much, how much does having to play for money add to the pressure? Obviously, it's no secret that in darts, it's difficult enough to throw darts if you're just practicing at home, but playing in front of a crowd is added pressure. But then the added pressure of knowing you're playing for money it's, must be difficult. It's, it's difficult at, at first. It's something that you have to get used to. But if you're playing for a mortgage payment, that's tough. You might think that, I've got three darts in my hand at double 16. If I hit this, the mortgage is paid this month. That's a horrible way to think. The best players in the world play without financial pressure. So as someone who may want to sponsor a player, if you firmly believe in this talent, take their financial pressure away and let them just play. Can you imagine a poker player with a whole stack of chips like this, feeling money pressure? No, because they're playing with chips. Someone who's got this much left will think, I'm playing with pressure. So it's hard to play for money, but if you can get used to it, that portfolio can grow. So I'm guessing at the top level, so Premier League, for example, they're not playing with financial pressures. No, they're not. They're very comfortable. And I know that Joe Cullen has said that he missed a dart for a quarter of a million pounds. I think technically it was 130,000, because I think he got 120,000 for the runners up spot. but. If you want to start a good series, ask dart players, what's the most expensive dart you've ever thrown? Oh, that's a good, good series. Do you know what I mean? Sure. So Joe Cullen missing double 16 by this much yeah. was for the best part of 125,000 pounds. What's, no, what's the most expensive dart you've ever thrown? Uh, it was for 32,000 pounds. It was when I hit the winning dart at the Players' Championship Finals in 2010. One shot, one hit. But what's the biggest one you've missed like, where you think? I lost that amount of money. Uh, I think it was the World Cup final. Yeah. yeah, I had two darts, one at tops, one at double 10. Missing those two cost me, I think it was an extra extra 10,000. But you were more upset about the honor that day. Oh yeah, it wasn't about the money. Mm. It had absolutely nothing to do about the money. It was about, it was about the medal. It was all about you know missing it for Australia, missing it for Simon. They were the things that hurt. It had nothing to do with the money. Do players care? Are there some players who care more about the money than titles? Absolutely. There are two different types of player out there, people who want to win titles and people who want to win money. I, I admire both. So you've got people who want silverware and you've got mercenaries. Mm. There are plenty of those. And you tend to find that the mercenaries are the guys who are more senior in age and rank. Is it, is it possible as a pro darts player to top up your money with another career? You know, you might be a joiner or a plumber or something. Can you still do that? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of players, like the security of having a job during the week and playing darts at the weekend. It's, it's a very well-paid hobby, if you can be really good at it. Jim Williams has got his own business, and he's a phenomenal darts player. And there was a lot made of people like Mark Webster and Johnny Clayton, who would still work during the week, even when they were doing 
massive things at the weekend. They might win eight, nine, ten thousand pounds at the weekend and then work during the week. But I don't think that was so, so much about the money and security. I think it was about giving themselves something else to think about during the week instead of thinking about darts seven days out of seven. And I admire that. And it just so happens that every example I gave you there was Welsh. <laughs> I think it says something about their work ethic. And it gives them the security that if something did go wrong, they've got another career. It wouldn't be the end of the world if they, their form went or they got their tied to sadly and they couldn't play anymore. They, yeah. they just say, well, I'll focus on a career that makes me happy. I admire the people who want that backstop because everybody's got to have their own formula. We've talked about the blueprint of getting from point A to the top of the pyramid. But ultimately, there are people who think, I can take pressure off my darts if I have something else that will provide for my family and for myself. I admire that. I went all in. I had a great six figure paying job in Australia and I said, I need a year off without pay to figure out if this works. And at one point I said, I have a decision to make. Is it pro or is it back to Australia to the job? I decided to stay. It was the right choice. You had a, you had a dart though, didn't you, to make at the end, you were about to, if you missed, you were going to go back home, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I, I was playing in Killarney in 2009, and if I didn't make a certain amount of money, that was me back on a plane. The return ticket was paid for, so I was going. And just so happened I made the final that weekend, and that was enough money to get me through the rest of the year. Four months later, I won the Players' Championship Finals for 60000 Is it easier to make a living from darts now with all more money than ever before? but there's more competition. Or back in the past when the competition was less and there was less money. It's definitely easier now. If you think about it in this regard, when I first started playing on the Pro Tour, you win one game or get to a certain stage of, I think it was the last 64, you get 75 pounds. That was pretty good. But then entering the tournament was 100 pounds. So you still had to win multiple games to cover some of your costs. Now, if you win one game, it's 750 pounds and you don't even have to pay to enter. Now, challenge to a level, which is the secondary level, women's series, uh, development tour, you do still have an entry fees, but they're nowhere near as big as uh, some of the pro tour entries were back in the day. But you have to win less games to get more money these days. So in that regard, it's easier, but you still have to work hard to get there. Let's talk quickly about uh, career after darts. Are there careers within darts once you finish playing? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing one of them right now. <laughs> Speaking to you guys, uh, I've played for a period of 15 years. I care about the future of this sport more than anything else. I love what I see with young people coming through this new blueprint. I want to look after people who want to play locally and get better. I want to look after professionals who want to find that extra 1%. But I also care about the integrity of the sport and the image of it going forward. Some people used to mock me in the early days when they'd see me going for a run at 7.30 in the morning before a tournament. They thought I was crazy. Now more people are doing such things and I care about how that image is portrayed in the public eye. But commentating, there have never been as many commentary jobs as there are right now for different promoters and different aspects of the sport, whether it's the Ladies Series, whether it's the Motor Super Series, whether it's PDC, whether it's WDF, uh, ADC or beyond. But there are other things you can do. You can become a, a player manager if you wish. You can follow people on the road and try and get them deals, be, become an agent. So many different things you can do. Well, there you have it, some fantastic insight into the financial aspects of being a professional darts player. For more in this series, make sure you keep an eye on the Sporting Life YouTube channel. And for everything else darts and Sporting Life, head to sportinglife.com forward slash darts.